All right, good morning. Happy Easter. Good to see you all this morning. Let's all stand together and sing. Happy Easter. 
What a great day to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord together. We're going to have a different kind of service today in terms of the order of things. So what I'd like to ask you to do is just say hello to a couple of people around you and then just have a seat where you are after you've done that. Just, just a quick hello, a good greeting. As you return to your seats, I want to ask you to get your bulletin out with me. Would you please take a moment, fill out your connecting card on the back part of that bulletin. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to, glad to have you. Uh, if you just fill out your name, your contact info, you can mark anything you might be interested to learn more about the church. On the back is a place to list any prayer requests that you might have. When you finish that connecting card, please tear it off. You can put it in the offering plates when they come by at the end of the service, or you can place it in one of the white boxes on our welcome tables on the way out of the room this morning. We would love to follow up with you. Uh, I promise you won't get a bunch of junk email from us. This will just be relevant information to you about the church. So once you've finished that connecting card, uh, you, would you please uh, tear that out and turn it in? There's also a digital version of that card available to you on our website, our Facebook page, and in the Version app. We'll be using the Version app uh, during our service so if you would like to follow along with the sermon, with scripture and sermon notes, you just open up the Bible app on a phone or tablet, search under events for Parkview Finley, and you'll find the scripture and sermon notes as long as the link to the connecting card uh, within the app there. As you do so, you'll uh, be able to, to turn right to the scripture we're going to begin with for our sermon in uh, just a moment. We're, we're going to be walking through today the, the biblical account of the, the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We're going to move through a couple of, of the gospel accounts, uh, talking about a variety of them, but reading mostly from Matthew and John. Uh, the words will be on the, the screen behind me if you'd like to follow along. I'd also encourage you to, to use a Bible, open it up, and, and read along on the pages of God's Word. I'm going to begin with the sermon right now. I know you're not accustomed to hearing me talk right at the beginning of the service. I hope you'll be willing to listen right now. I'm going to, we're going to speak for just a little bit. Uh, then we're going to have communion and worship. And then we're going to have a second part to the sermon. Yes, you have to hear me twice today. And we'll come back and bore you some more. We'll have a second part of the sermon talking about the resurrection and then conclude uh, our service as normal. So right now, I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. I want to ask a question. A question of you to think about. Have you, have you ever had the opportunity for an unexpected reunion with someone that, that you knew before? I was driving uh, through Bowling Green a couple of years ago, stopped at, a, at a, a gas pump. I think it was a BP right off the interstate there before the roundabout when, you know, the exit was, was you just come off and hang a left in there. Uh, pretty close to El Zarape. They've got great soup there at that Mexican place you've never been. I pulled into this gas station and started pumping gas, looked over at the set of pumps next to me, and I saw a face that I recognized, a man I hadn't seen in years, Mr. Brown, Bob Brown. I stayed with his family when I did my internship in college in Markle, Indiana, a small, a small town across the border. Wonderful people. And Bob is, has an unmistakable look. He looks a little bit like Norm from This Old House. You ever watch that PBS show with Bob Vila and Norm? He looked like that guy. And so when I spotted him, I was like, that's got to be Bob Brown. Walked over, he and his wife were there just passing through. And, and we got to catch up and, and talk about old times, talk about how the kids were doing as they had gotten older. It had been years since I'd seen them. And it was, it was this joyful reunion, just out of the blue, unexpected. And it was, it was fun to, to have that opportunity to see someone again. I think about the, the joy of, of reconnecting in that way. And it's something I know I should do more of. I've never been to a high school reunion from my graduating class. I, I've heard about them coming up, and I've heard about them as they pass by. I've, I've never made the effort to go back. I, I have great friends from high school that I've lost touch with. And I don't make the effort to contact them. I don't spend the money to go drive and see them. I haven't reconnected with those really, really good friends that I once had. And now, they're, they're a memory. Can you imagine how, how great that reunion would be if one or the other of us would, would 
would get in, in contact and say, hey, let's, let's make an effort to, to get together. Let's, let's set a date. Let's, let's pay the expense of travel so that we can see each other again and, and talk about what life looks like and, and, and reconnect. As fun as it was to meet Bob and his family unexpectedly, how much more meaningful would a reunion be if it really cost me something? If, if, I, was, if I was taking a, a significant effort to make that reunion happen. We think about the story of Jesus and his death and burial and resurrection. We think about how the disciples were, were separated from him for just a matter of days and the, and the joy they felt when he came back to see them. And we think about the significance in our lives of what Christ did for us to bring us back into relationship with him. I want, I want you to be thinking about that idea of reunion as we begin moving through our story today. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 27, and we're going to be in re, begin reading in verse 15. We've got a lot of scripture to cover today as we move through this account from the Word of God. And, and I don't want to apologize for that. I want to be glad that we have a, an opportunity to read together from the Word of God. Beginning in verse 15. Now it was the, the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. If you've been following along in our sermon series, you know that Jesus is in Jerusalem for the, the, the festival of, of, of Passover. And it's a significant time that he and his disciples have been working toward uh, what's going to take place on the cross. And Jesus has been arrested. He has been on trial in a variety of places. And now he's with Pilate, the governor. At that time, verse 16, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who's called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that the crowd had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Now, which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. Well, what shall I do then with Jesus, who's called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Well, why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. As we, as we continue through this, this passage, I want to I think about this idea of responsibility. That, that, that's really one of the, the key points here as, as Pilate is interacting with the crowd. Who's responsible for the death of Jesus? Pilate doesn't seem to want to take any responsibility here. He's heard his wife interrupt proceedings and say, hey, hey, I had a dream about this guy that's on trial. Have nothing to do with him. This was a terrible dream. Pilate is arguing with the crowd, a gathered group of, of people. And I see this scene unfolding as he's shouting out questions to the crowd. And they're shouting back over them. He's, he's shouting over the, the noise to get their attention. Who do you want me to release to you? This, this very difficult means of communicating with the group of people. And he comes to the place where... where he refuses to accept responsibility for the death of Jesus. He washes his hands publicly. This isn't, this isn't on me. This man who's about to die, this, this, this is on you. The, the weight of this burden, this guilt, I, I place this man's blood on you. And they say, no, let his blood be on our heads. Let his blood be on the heads of our children. We'll accept full responsibility for the death of Jesus, the crowd says. But is it their responsibility? Scripture tells us that the religious leaders are in and amongst the crowd, stirring things up. Ask for Jesus to be crucified. Ask for Barabbas to be released. Make sure it's Jesus who dies. And the crowd is stirred up, this mob mentality, and they're calling for the death of Jesus. They're willing to accept responsibility, but is it truly theirs? Pilate's quick to pass that responsibility on to the people, someone else, so he doesn't have to, to take that burden on himself. 
What about Jesus? In the midst, midst of this story unfolding, Jesus is willingly laying down his life. He has made a decision to sacrifice himself on the cross. He is taking responsibility not only for his death, he is taking responsibility for the sin of the world, a burden that he bears on his shoulders. As he laid himself down on the cross. This idea of responsibility is important. It's important for us to consider the, the weight of this burden as well. See, a crucifixion like this on a cross couldn't have happened to a Roman citizen. The cross was reserved for slaves, for those who, who weren't Roman citizens. And the Jewish leaders, they were allowed by the Roman government to remain uh, with their nation intact under the umbrella of Rome, but they weren't allowed to execute anyone. And so they wanted Jesus to die, but they had no power to, to accomplish that on their own. They had to surrender Jesus to, to the Roman government. And because Jesus wasn't a Roman citizen, this kind of execution was possible. Not only possible, it was advantageous to the Jewish leaders. See, there's this passage from Deuteronomy chapter 21 that talks about any person who's hung on a tree. That person bears a curse from God. It was a representation that they wanted applied to Jesus. They wanted not only to end his life, they wanted to discredit him in the eyes of the crowd. They didn't want people following his teaching. They didn't want anyone to believe what he said about himself. They didn't want anyone to leave their tradition behind to accept Jesus as Messiah. And so they sent Jesus to be hung on a cross to take this curse, to take this punishment upon himself. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent. He had been speaking with Jesus, questioning him, and he, he was amazed at the way Jesus stood and heard the accusations. He was amazed at the way Jesus withstood all of the things they were saying about him. He couldn't understand why the religious leaders wanted him to die. It didn't seem right to him, and yet he feared the pressure of the crowd. His reputation as the governor of this region depended on keeping the peace. He had to report to his superiors, all the people who reported to him. He was responsible for making sure that the region remained peaceful, that there weren't any uprisings, that there weren't any, any difficulties that came from the general population. And so this crowd gathered together as they began to, to, to gather and raise their voices, posed a threat to Pilate. He had to quiet them. He had to pacify them. And fearing the pressure of the crowd, he chose to do something against his conscience, against what he knew was right. He chose instead to bow to the pressure of the crowd. And he chose to do something that he knew was wrong. And we look back on the story and we're pretty hard on Pilate. Seeing him wash his hands of responsibility looks like a coward. Seeing this moment where he refused to live according to his conscience. Pathetic. But is it so? Is it so hard to, to understand what it feels like to, to be pressured by people around you? To know what's right? To know the kind of standards you should be living by and yet bow to that pressure? agree to do something that you don't feel very good about, but because there's people watching, because there's this fear of rejection, worry about humiliation, you turn to something that you know you shouldn't be doing instead of standing for what's right. This is the example we need to learn from and not follow. When we feel that pressure, when we feel that weight, that burden, it is, it is a very significant moment for us to answer that guidance of the Lord, to answer that, that sense of our conscience, to do what's right, even in the most difficult moments. See, Jesus was innocent. But he took the place of the guilty. And 
Pilate allowed it to happen. Allowed the crowd to demand the death of Jesus. And as they were demanding that Jesus be executed, what else did they demand? A notorious criminal be released to them. In other passages, we hear that Barabbas is uh, an insurrectionist, potentially a murderer. And this is the man that they want to be set free among the crowd. Yeah, let that guy go. Yeah, Barabbas, let's have that guy free to do whatever he wants. You execute Jesus, this innocent man. And yet that's exactly what happened. And this, this illustration we have is such a perfect picture of what Jesus does. He takes the place of the guilty even though he's innocent. And he went to the cross in place of Barabbas. He laid himself down where another man should have been killed. And we think, wow, that's that's a noble thing. But then we think more about that that substitution. We, We think more about how it is that Jesus takes the place of the guilty. And it feels a little more personal when we think about how why Jesus died. To take the place of every person who would fall short of the glory of God. To receive on himself the punishment that every person who succumbed to sin deserved to pay. He paid it for us. To provide the means of our salvation, he laid his life down and took our punishment from us. Jesus takes the place of our guilty conscience. Even though he was innocent, he paid the price for us. He accepted our guilt and was punished on our behalf. And because he was innocent, because there was no sin in his life, his payment could be applied to our account. And so when we think about responsibility, we know that Jesus made a willful decision, but it was my sin that he died for. It's our sin that he willingly took upon himself paid the price to forgive. Passage continues in verse 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him, and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, and they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him, took his staff, and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. They led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon. They forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Now two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those passing by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You, who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross, if you truly are the Son of God. In the same way, the the chief priests, the teachers of the law, elders mocked him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down. Let him come down now from the cross, and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. And in the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. It was a time of pain and humiliation for Jesus. In Luke's gospel, we uh, read more about this exchange between Jesus and the men who were hanging next to him. One of them having witnessed the way Jesus endured all of this punishment and ridicule, turned his heart toward the Lord. And he asked Jesus to remember him when Jesus came into his kingdom. 
But even in his death, Jesus was turning hearts toward him. Even in the way that he endured this pain and humiliation, his presence caused another man to believe. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus, forgiving sins. He has the power. He has the authority. He has the right to forgive. This is what he's done throughout his ministry, infuriating the religious leaders as he would encounter people in great need, and he would heal them and forgive their sin. And sometimes he would forgive their sin and then say, well, just so everyone around you knows that your sins are forgiven, why don't I just heal you while I'm in the process of taking care of these needs? Jesus has every right and authority and power to forgive those who come to him because of his sacrifice on the cross, because he purchased that right with his blood. Matthew focused particularly on the torture and humiliation of Jesus. These, these are difficult passages to read. And I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the, the blood and the gruesome nature of the torture of our Lord and Savior. But I do want you to notice the significance of those things. Notice how the, the, the religious leaders continued to mock Jesus even as he was dying, challenging his identity, pressing him to, to do something miraculous. Call on God to save you. You saved others, but you can't save yourself. You're the son of God. Have him, have him bring you down off that cross. Then, then maybe we'll believe in you if you can come down off the cross. They had no intention of turning their hearts to the Lord. And even when Jesus emerged from the tomb, they still didn't believe. And yet, in the face of that humiliation, in the face of the temptation that they presented to him, Jesus remained faithful with resolute determination. Even though they, they pushed him to call on the power of God to lift him off the cross, Jesus refused to take that path. It was necessary for him to give his life to redeem the sin of the world, to bring us back to a place where we could come into relationship with him. And he would not be swayed from that path. He would not change course. He would continue making decisions, living in alignment with that mission and purpose. That's the example Jesus provides, to strive for faithfulness and continually make the decisions required to stay on that path. See, faithfulness requires us to continually choose to do the right thing. It's the power of choice that we have each and every day, each and every moment of the day. And when we accept Christ, we don't simply say, God, I want to be yours. I want to, I want to live for you and walk away from that moment and just continue living life as it comes. That decision about faithfulness is something we have to actively be a part of every moment. Every day of our lives, we have to continue making choices that keep us on that path. As we come to an intersection, we have to continue making the choice that will keep us on the path that he's leading us down. We can't be, be pulled aside by sin. We can't be pushed off course by the pressure of people around us. We have to make the decisions that will keep us on the path of faithfulness. And it's not something we can do passively. It's not something we can sit back in a recliner and say, well, I hope things unfold so that I can continue to be faithful to God. Whatever it is that, that comes my way, maybe God will just help me be a good person. No, faithfulness is a matter of decision, a matter of choice, a determined will that says, God, I know what you did for me, and I want to live for you. And I know there are going to be tough choices. I know I'm going to struggle with those decisions. I know it's going to be hard. Would you help me, by the power of your spirit indwelling me, would you help me make the right choice in those moments? Would you help me see the right path? Would you convict me about what's right and help me make those decisions? Jesus continually lived according to his decision and sacrificed himself on the cross. And sure, he was tempted. Satan met him in the wilderness, tempted him, away from this course. In the garden of Gethsemane, before he was arrested, Jesus wrestled with this decision, saying, 
God, if there's any other way, you could take this cup from me. But then he asserted his will and made the decision that he would follow the plan. God, not my will, but yours be done. And here on the cross, the religious leaders are coming to him, taunting him, and laying in front of him more temptation. Free yourself from the cross. Don't go through with this. Call on the power of God. And Jesus withstood that temptation and was faithful to do what was right, actively pursuing this goal, watching other people passively make the wrong choices as Pilate let things happen in front of him. Jesus actively chose the right path. And we have to be decisive and specific in the decisions we make each and every day to choose to stay on that path of faithfulness. Continue in verse 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those standing there heard this, they said. He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge and filled it with vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, I'll leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. And when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea, Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. We recognize the, the impact that Jesus had on those people who were around. Those who knew him and had followed him and were present at his crucifixion. Even, even the, the soldiers who were standing guard, when they saw the power of God, when they saw what Jesus was doing, when they encountered his presence, even as he was dying on the cross, they believed. They needed no, no teaching or training. In the presence of Jesus, they believed. And as significant and, and, and amazing as that was, Jesus died for a much greater impact. He died to make an impact. Not just locally, those people that were closest to him. He died for the world. Not just the world at the time of his death, but the world for all time. He died for you and for me. Jesus sacrificed himself to free us from sin. And he endured that pain because he loves us. Because he cared for us enough to place himself there. There's a story in, in scripture about, about the apostle Paul being arrested. And the, the Roman soldiers who, who arrest him uh, are, are getting ready to beat him. And, and Paul says, whoa, 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 wait. You, you can't actually do any of this because I'm a Roman citizen. There's been no trial. There's, you can't prove anything. And before you begin uh, this, this idea of punishing me, first you need to appeal to your governor. You need, you need to go up the chain a little bit because you, you have no authority to do anything to me. Now, Jesus had greater authority than that. He... he had the power of the kingdom of God at his disposal, and yet he chose not to use it. He laid down his life, sacrificing himself so that he could provide grace and forgiveness to us. 
so that he could free us from sin. So he could free us from the hold that sin would have in our lives. Jesus died to release us from all of that. He gave his all. He gave his very life to extend grace and forgiveness to the world. He died for you and for me. He died for every person in the world, knowing that not every person would accept the gift that he was giving to them. He cared enough to do it anyway. Jesus sacrificed himself to free us from sin. We turn to the book of John for the next portion of these events. It was the day of preparation. The next day was to be a special Sabbath because the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. Soldiers, therefore, came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony. His testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. John's words here draw our attention to sacrifice. They point us to this idea that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb who died to pay for our sin. Now, in the Old Testament, we read about how those sacrifices were made, that the lamb that was chosen had to be perfect, without any blemish or defect, with no broken bones, without a limp, a perfect specimen, a costly sacrifice to pay for the wrong, to pay for the sin. And so John draws our attention to the fact that Jesus was perfect. He had never sinned, and not even had he suffered a broken bone. Even though that was the normal custom for, for those who were crucified on a cross, it didn't happen to Jesus. He is the lamb who was slain, whose blood pays the price for our sin. John's words rem remind us of, of the people of Israel who were leaving Exodus, escaping from Pharaoh when the plagues came, and the instructions that were given to them by God through Moses were to, to, to sacrifice a lamb and to take the blood of the lamb and paint it on the doorframe of their houses that would identify them belonging to the Lord so that when the angel of death came through, he would pass over those homes. That's the celebration of Passover that Jesus just, just partook in with his disciples. Because the blood marked them belonging to the Lord. The blood of Christ washes away our sin and marks us as his own. And he allowed his blood to flow so that we could choose to accept him. He allowed himself to die so that his blood would pay the price for our sin. He laid down his life so that we could be marked as his own. And we remember his sacrifice with grateful hearts. And as we gather together to worship him, we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And we take simple elements, simple emblems to remind us of his body that was hung on the cross, to remind us of his blood that was shed, to forgive our sin. And this morning, as the trays are passed, I'd invite all, all believers who are with us worshiping to, to join together in this remembrance of Jesus. That as the trays are passed, you take a stack of cups out. The bottom cup will have bread in it. The upper cup will have juice in it. And after you've taken a moment to reflect and remember the sacrifice of Jesus, would you eat the bread and think about the body of Jesus? Would you drink the cup and be grateful for the blood of Christ that washes away our sin? Let me, let me pray, and then we'll begin our celebration of the Lord's Supper together. God, thank you. Thank you for 
the love that was expressed toward us. Thank you for the willingness that, that Jesus had to live on this earth and to lay his life down for us. Thank you for the pain he endured. Thank you for the grace that he made available to us. As we eat and drink together, God, I pray that you will draw our hearts and minds toward you as we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.
paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my Can you imagine how difficult this time would have been for the disciples? What, what grief and mourning they would have been enduring. Watching Jesus die. Knowing his body was being prepared. Those closest to Jesus were dealing with loss. Such a, such a difficult thing for, for each of us. They were working on their own pain as they were saying goodbye to the man that they had followed. And yet, even in this difficulty, Jesus is going to answer that pain. We turn to John chapter 19. We'll begin reading in verse 38. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen, This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now, Romans typically would leave those who had been executed hanging on the cross. They would come back later and take the remains and just bury all of the remains of whoever it was that had been crucified together in one grave. They didn't care. These weren't Roman citizens. They, weren't, they were, many of them, slaves. Nothing in the eyes of the Romans. According to Jewish custom, the body of an Israelite had to be cared for in a specific way. It had to be removed from hanging before sundown. And as the day of preparation, Sabbath was coming, they needed to take care of the body of Jesus. Joseph went to Pilate and claimed the body and cared for it and placed it in the tomb. The the women who were going to come and put perfume on the body of Jesus wouldn't be able to come back till after the Sabbath. But notice who it was that stepped forward to care for Jesus. Joseph. Nicodemus. Disciples who were secret disciples, if that's a thing. Can you be a true disciple of Jesus in secret? They were afraid of the religious leaders. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin. Joseph, research a little, also was a part of this leadership. Nicodemus met with Jesus in the dark of night so no one would know about his budding belief in this man, son of God, the Messiah. They kept their belief in him a secret, hiding their feelings until he died. And they came forward, stepping into the light to claim the body of Jesus and care for him. I wonder, I wonder what might have happened if these two men had, had come forward sooner. If, if they might have made their belief in Jesus known, if sitting among the religious leaders, 
they, they would have said to, to another person, you know, I've got some questions. I don't, I don't think our, our understanding of this man is right. What if he is the Son of God? What if he is the Messiah? How many more people might they have they persuaded to turn their hearts toward him? How many more people might have believed in Jesus if they had lived true to their belief in him? See, every day we have opportunity to make a difference in the lives of people, to live out our faith publicly, and step forward into the light and, and be known as one who follows Jesus, who believes in him, who is a disciple, who is a believer, who is a Christian. Every day we could be making a significant impact in the lives of people, pointing them to the Lord. And every day we have that choice to make about our faithfulness. Every day we have a choice to make about our example, about our witness in the world around us to point people to the Lord. And here, Nicodemus and Joseph chose their moment to live according to their relationship with Jesus. And every day you and I have that same decision to make. The events unfold, continue in Matthew 28, beginning verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. For I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He's risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now, I've told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. These women had a chance encounter with Jesus. The angel told them to expect to see him, but as they were running, there he was, unexpectedly, this reunion. And they were filled with joy meeting Jesus. And they continued on their path to tell the disciples that Jesus would meet them in Galilee. The disciples who, who would be reunited with Jesus and experience this same joy. Have their hope restored as they step back into his presence. We, let's consider just for a moment the, the understanding of the disciples, the belief that they had in Jesus. These are, these are men who, who way, way back at the beginning of the New Testament heard Jesus and made a decision to follow him. They left their lives behind, their occupations, their families, and they, 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 they chose to become his disciples, to live with him, to, to travel with him, to be a part of the ministry that he was doing. They devoted themselves. They continued to travel with him. And when, when events came up that, that Jesus would, would return to a region where, where he wasn't welcome, like when Lazarus died and he went back to Jerusalem, his disciples said, hey, wait, wait, wait. You remember the last time we were in Jerusalem? They wanted to kill you. If we go back there, things might get ugly. And together they said, you know what? Let's go with him so that we can die with him. If, if they're so intent on taking his life, let's, let's follow through. Let's, let's be with him, even if it means our death. These are men who were committed to Jesus. And at his death, they were filled with grief. This is someone that they were, they were so deeply connected to that his loss was, was significant. Now, they, they knew what Jesus had said about his death. They had heard him talking about how he would, he would die, and three days later, he, he would come back, that he would lay his life down and pick it back up again. 
They knew what, what the cross would mean for him as he talked to them very specifically about going to sacrifice himself. And yet, in this moment, they're so overwhelmed with their loss that they can't make sense of the situation. They don't remember those things. It won't be until later they look back and, and realize all the things that they missed in the process. You see, as we pursue Jesus, sometimes we, we have that same experience. We, we believe in him, and, and we, we trust him. We read his word, and as we're growing in our understanding of who he is, we learn that living according to those beliefs isn't easy. And in the midst of pressure and difficulty, sometimes, sometimes we just we don't quite get it right. And later we look back and we, we recognize how important it is for us to live according to our belief in Jesus every moment of every day. And as we grow in our understanding of who he is and, and what he calls us to as his, as his followers, we recognize how difficult it is to live according to those beliefs, how much they, they require of us, how much more complicated our lives become when we choose faithfulness, how much more difficult it is to take a stand and, and to follow the path that we're called to, but how valuable it is for us to walk through life with the Lord, to remain in his presence, to choose faithfulness, to choose to be a reflection of his love and grace in the world around us. If the disciples had remembered accurately all the things that Jesus said, they might not have been so overwhelmed with grief and sorrow. They might have been spared this difficult time, but think about How joyful this experience was for them to be reunited with Jesus. How instead of maintaining hope, they had their hope restored. That Jesus answered their grief, lifted their spirits to such joy and hope as they encountered his presence again. This is what Jesus brings to our lives. Hope and joy in his presence that we can find nowhere else. And it's the answer that meets our needs. It's the answer that meets the needs that we experience in the world around us. We look at the world and we see people dealing with this difficulty every day, this emptiness, this loneliness, this, this grief and sorrow, this pain that they can't seem to answer. We feel it at times as well. This the sense of, of meaninglessness and all of the pursuits of life. It's hope is hard to take hold of and loneliness seems to define our generation. The answer is found in Jesus. The hope and joy that we find in his presence is the only answer to that emptiness we find in the world around us. It restores us to life in relationship with him. This is the victory of the cross. Jesus sacrificed himself to overcome sin and death, to, to offer us a chance at true life in him. And his resurrection makes possible this new life in him that calls us to live differently than we ever did before, that calls us to be reunited and to celebrate in the joy of having come back into the presence of Jesus. Not a chance encounter, not an accidental bumping into him. Oh, what, it's great to see you again. This Reunion is something that cost Jesus dearly, that he paid the price to make happen, that we would come back to him. And it's so much more meaningful, it's so much more special because he made it possible. Now, I can't even take the effort to pick up a phone and call a, an old friend from high school and make a reunion happen. Jesus laid down his life. He endured the pain of the cross. He allowed his blood to be shed so that you could return to relationship with him. Now we think about, about accepting Christ as Lord and Savior, and most of the time we would say, well, I'm, I'm accepting Christ for the first time. This isn't a reunion. I'm, I'm getting to know the Lord now for the first time, but this is, this is the creator of the universe who knew you. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew you, and he watched as you walked away from him to pursue sin, and he died so that you could return, so you could come back into relationship with him. And for him, this is a sweet reunion of 
an embrace that's long overdue. As he leads you back where you belong, a place of rightness in the presence of your Savior, the place where you were made to be. This morning I want to offer an invitation to you to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, to confess your faith in him, to repent of your sins, be baptized in his name, to come back, to take advantage of this reunion that he's made possible. And I also want to challenge those of you who are believers in Jesus not to let anything hide your faith in him, not to, not to be worried about the crowd, about people, about pressure, not to be worried about what, what consequences may come, not to worry about humiliation, not to be afraid of anything in the world around you, but to live your faith in Jesus in a way that will make an impact in the world around you, that your relationships with people would exist so that you can turn people's hearts toward him, that you would take every opportunity to guide people back to, to see Jesus for who he is. Would you live according to that calling? If you have a decision to make this morning, if there's anything in your life you'd like to have prayer for, would you come forward as we stand and sing together? Please stand. Thank you. 
sing hallelujah the lamb has overcome we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah the lamb has overcome Some say king, wonder working rebel priest, Jesus Christ the Nazarene. He knew well what it would take to free us all from sin and grace. A perfect man. Sunday is coming. Don't lose hope, cause Sunday is coming. Devil, you're done, you better start running. Friday's good, cause Sunday is coming. So we let those soldiers take. betrayed him with the kiss. There before the mocking crowd, like a lamb to the slaughter didn't make a sound. Then he carried that cross to Calvary, and he shed his last and bowed his head the son of God and man was dead with bloody hands 
tears on their face they laid him down inside that grave that wasn't the end that wasn't the end that wasn't the end let me tell you what happened next the women came before the dawn to find that stone already gone when they looked inside the angel said why are you looking for the living among the dead he's alive he's alive hallelujah he's alive give him praise lift him high hallelujah he's alive he's alive he's alive hallelujah he's alive give him praise lift him high Upon the throne, all heaven sings to him alone. We watch and wait like a bride for a groom. O oh, church, arise, he's coming soon. What a wonderful day that'll be.
vanishes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. By your Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. Resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. By your Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting is our hope just as Jesus was raised from the dead we too one day will be raised from the dead you can have a seat this morning we're going to continue our worship and our giving we're going to take up an offering if you're visiting with us please don't feel any obligation for that but we want this good news of Jesus's death and resurrection to be shared to all the world so that they can have the hope that we have and so we give this morning 
And uh, while the gentleman pass the trays, we'll have some announcements behind me. Let's pray, though, first. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for the hope that we have, and we look forward. Oh, we look forward to the day when we will join you, Lord. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for the victory that is in you. Thank you for the hope that we have. We don't have to live in sin and death and in the hopelessness that we once lived in and the darkness, God, but we can live in the light and in the power of your Holy Spirit, knowing, Father, that one day we will be reunited with you for eternity. And we look forward to that day, Father. Thank you so much. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Parkview. We're so happy to have you joining us this morning. There are a lot of things happening here, so we want to take just a minute to get you up to date on all that's going on. The Backyard Mission Trip will be on April 27th this year. If you would like to be a part of this service opportunity for the community, we would love to have your participation either serving on one of the teams or potentially even leading one of those teams. If you have an interest, please sign up at the Connecting Wall. On April 21st, we're going to be relaunching our children's ministry areas. And we're going to be giving tours, giving away some cool stuff, and we would love to have you join us. Now, if you look around the room and you see some families missing, then please take the time to let them know that they need to be here on April 21st. Or maybe you have some friends that have never been here, and this would be a great opportunity for you to invite them to come and join us on that morning. We've got a lot of cool things for you guys to see, but we've also been keeping some stuff back that you don't know about, and we're gonna be revealing them on that Sunday morning, and we would love to have you here to see those things and to join in the celebration. So please join us on April 21st during our services as we celebrate the children's ministry spaces. Hey ladies, if you are looking for a fun way to get some exercise with some of your friends from church, a new session of cardio drumming will start April 2nd, and that will be on Tuesdays at 6.30. Contact Amanda Morrison if you're interested. DIY Putt-Putt is back. On April 6th at 2 p.m., we will be having our one-of-a-kind, unique, miniature golf course right here inside Parkview's building. Here's how it works. We ask you, the congregation, to come up with holes. It could be something you make as an individual. It could be something you make as a family. However you want to do, you design it, you build it, and you bring it here, and we lay it out inside this building. So please, if you're interested, sign up at the connecting wall, take one of the forms, fill it out, and return it so we know the dimensions and the size. It'll help us kind of know where to place our holes on our course. But there's lots of different ways to participate. You can build a hole, you can build a hole and play, or you can just show up and play on April 6th at 2 p.m. However you decide to participate, we would love to have you there. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you have any questions about the events going on, you can always go to our website at parkviewfindley.org. You can also check us out on Facebook. And if you just want to speak with someone, you can stop by the Welcome Center and speak with someone there. Uh, if you're a first time guest with us this morning, you can stop by there and also pick up a free gift for you. Thank you again and have a wonderful week. All right, thank you so much for joining us. Happy Easter, everyone.